Good afternoon, Joe. It's great to have you here. And I've been looking forward to doing this for a long time. I have too, John. I this, we'll have some fun. this, ladies and gentlemen, who, uh, who happen to be watching at the moment, is Joseph Purcell, who some of you, uh, a good many of you will know and remember. Um, and I'll let him tell as we get there about what he did when we were working together here in the district. But first of all, I'd like to start off. Your name, I know from my own Irish heritage, is not pronounced Purcell in Ireland. Tell me That's about correct. your name. Tell me about your name. Well, it's Purcell in Ireland, uh, but it dates back to the, um, uh, the Norman conquest. And the name is actually a French name, Purcell. Uh, there are many, many Irish names that have their origins in, in, uh, in France, and it's just one of them. Um, they came over, I guess, pretty early and were awarded lands either by William the Conqueror himself or by subsequent kings uh, to get them out of England <laughs> yeah. because he didn't want any rivals. And they settled in Ireland, which was a, a pretty... Uh, uh, primitive uh, country at the time. What part of Ireland did your family settle in when they when they arrived? Uh, well, like, all I can say is where they came from. Yes, Basically, exactly. they came from Limerick oh. and, and Tipperary. All right, fascinating. Uh, which is is beyond the pale, as they you say bet. in Ireland. You bet. And uh, they're also known as as more Irish than the Irish because yes. they were landholders. But when the English came over in force, they were among the people who were dispossessed, or at least they were. Uh, the English attempted to dispossess them, and of course they fought, they had the most to lose, so perhaps in some ways they, they fought the hardest. As we speak, uh, there is a book rising in the bestseller list, and we spoke a little bit about it before, right. because uh, Frank McCourt, who, uh, who has written a book and used to teach English in at Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan, uh, grew up in Limerick, such oh, yeah. as your family, and so we're talking about the... Uh, it's still a poor heritage. town. Uh, it sure is, uh, yes. But uh, they've done quite a bit. The Irish have poured in quite a bit of money. Of course, most of the money is European money. Yeah. Which, yes. Uh, with well, the funds yeah. coming in from the uh, ECU, Ireland has done very well over the last couple of years. Now, there have been quite a few changes there. But let's bring it back sure. to, to <laughs> Joe Purcell and, and uh, his American experience. Particularly, you've lived now in Huntington Station for 30-some odd years, you were That's telling That's correct, me. yes. About 36, I guess. And uh, all of the, the children are grown and, and on their own at this point. Tell well, me I have five children. Uh, uh, <laughs> and it's been a relief since last year. This is the first full year that we've had with no children in college since I've been 40 years old. So, yes. so it's, been, it's been an economic relief, if nothing else. I got a little bit of relief between the, the fourth child, my second daughter, Christine, and, and Matthew, my youngest, of about two years. But mentally, one does not adjust in two years. I'm no. still living the life of a, a kind of a poverty-stricken life. All, all that sudden <laughs> quiet is a bit much at first, too. Well, of course, it? I've got my mother. Well, she doesn't make a lot of noise, but I've got my mother-in-law <laughs> living with me, too. She's a lovely lady. <laughs> and, and, yes. and no, you're right. It is much more quiet in the house. Yeah. So. So it's your mother-in-law and, and... And my wife and myself. And now. your wife and yeah. yourself. And my mother's still alive, too. She lives... Oh, yes. Yeah, she lives... She's uh, in her 80s, and she yes. lives uh, by herself. She takes All care of herself. Yeah. Tell me about Tell me about the grown children. They name them and... What well, the oldest guy is Mike, and he's a, an electrical and a computer engineer, and uh, he works in a firm now. He's one of those who are now working from home, mm -hmm. and he's he connects with his own... Uh, uh, home office and whatnot uh, every day by computer. So he works and does the troubleshooting right from his own house. Now, he also has to travel on occasion, yeah. but that's his position. Uh, my son, Kev, uh, by the way, the oldest guy went to RPI. Uh, mm -hmm. Second one is Kev. Kevin uh, went to Duke and uh, a very different personality, of course, each each child is. They all have, have their own um, thrust and whatnot. Kev is a, is a commuter. He owns a house in Hicksville and um, with his wife and uh, goes to Manhattan uh, to goes work. to Manhattan to work. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. he, he works okay. uh, for an insurance firm over there. Uh -huh. Actually, he works with Zurich and he has a kind of a niche position, which is very difficult for me to understand. <laughs> so All right. I, but it, evidently it, it does pretty well. Uh, <clears throat> then my oldest girl is Teresa and she got married uh, about a year ago and um, she married a fine young man who um, uh, 
works for the um, Cold Spring Harbor Labs. Uh -huh. And my daughter, who was working there, uh, I'll be uh, felt that oh. it was better to leave. After James after Watson's uh, of James yes, Watson's that's right. fame. Yeah, Watson's realm, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is now working as, uh, she graduated from Syracuse uh, with a business degree, and she is now working for a website uh, creator uh, on Long Island. And, There's uh, a 21st century uh, employment, if I ever heard of one. Well, basically, that's true. Uh, yeah. Most of the kids have gotten into some sort of thing that is rather techy in one way or another. Yeah. My daughter, Christine, was a psych major in college, and she went to, uh, she went to, uh, uh, I can never seem to remember the uh, name. Out of Pennsylvania. state? Pennsylvania. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, she went to Pennsylvania. And um, she got a degree in psychology. And I said to her, why in the world psychology? What are you mm. going to do with it? You know. And she said, well, I'm very interested in it. And although I don't intend to go on and be a psychologist, I think it would be very good. And I just kind of shook my head by that time I had learned that Parents don't know everything. And uh, <laughs> I uh, said, well, okay, okay. I said, oh, my wife, I'm a psychology, why? I don't think it was a month later, the New York Times published a, uh, a big article saying that uh, girls who graduate from a business degree with a business degree don't do nearly as well as men do. But girls who graduate with a psychology degree do very well in business. And in fact, they're the ones that hold the highest business positions. Fantastic. And wow. I said to myself, well, now what? See, yes. again, I, I, Once I'm, again, I'm, I'm behind the loop, you know, That's right. sort of out of the loop. So, uh, and she, she has a very nice position now. She's now director of, uh, of uh, TV for Macy's, and she operates out of New York, but she's all over the East Coast, all the way Wonderful. to, uh, I guess, to the Rocky Mountains, or the Mississippi, anyway. Well, she, she ought to she enjoy does. this when she gets to say hello yeah. out there, when you see your dad. And then Matt graduated last, uh, last spring, and he is now uh, running, the, he's a manager, he's in horticulture, and he manages a wholesale nursery out on Long Island. And, I'll be uh, done. Okay. Yeah, and uh, he seems very happy, too. What, so what year did you fine. retire, Joe? I retired in 92, okay. June of 92. And it's four years ago already. It, it goes very quickly. And at the time I retired, I felt that I probably, uh, Matt would graduate that year, but because of a whole series of circumstances, including changing a major, it took him another couple of yes. years. Yes. And, um, um, well, I didn't expect it, but it's worked out fine. Listen, before we, before yeah. I change uh, and take you on a, diff on a different path here in this discussion, I wanted to ask you, do your youngsters uh, now employed and on their own paths, do you see a reflection of the qualities and the interests that your family, the generations of your family, have had, or is this a first time? Is this a first time experience for this generation of of, uh, of offspring of the Purcells? You know what I'm saying? To well, you? there's no. I, I think there's. Um, I didn't have a very strong traditional upbringing either. Okay. I, I came from a mixed heritage mm -hmm. of Irish and, and uh, Scotch and, and, and French and whatnot. Uh, so therefore, I didn't have a strong identification with a particular heritage. Uh, and therefore, I didn't. I made sure that I didn't insult any heritage okay. because but there were no. Important. Were there any interests that seem to exist in the family down through the generations that you? Could well, see? yes, there is a kind of a thing. My my. Uh, my grandfather on my on my um, mother's side was an electrical engineer for the BMT railroad uh -huh. because my oldest son became an engineer. I was very interested in actuarial work myself when I was starting to go to college, and uh, therefore uh, uh, it's kind of interesting because my second son Kev decided that he might like that. He eventually decided against it. He was passing his test and doing fine, but he just said, I just don't want to be an actuary. It's it's just not for me. He's entirely too outgoing in mm -hmm. personality. So we went in another direction. He's doing very well. Uh, Teresa and Christine uh, each have demonstrated in one way or another certain affinities with certain uh, mm -hmm. of their ancestors. There's mm -hmm. no question about that. Um, Christine, I think, I mean, uh, Teresa certainly takes after her mother in the sense that she's a very caring person, uh, very, uh, very concerned with the welfare of other people, and uh, will go out of her way to help a great many people. 
that I probably wouldn't be as generous with. <laughs> okay. uh, she right. uh, she yes. really is willing to invest a lot of time and yes. even money yes. in, in the rehabilitation of people who uh, who um, uh, are having difficulty. But that's a life. trait that you see on your wife. I saw family. it in my father. You did you? Okay. My father had people come to his funeral and tell me stories about the things that he did for them that I had no clue about, ah. except that when I delivered, he was a fireman, mm -hmm. and as a second job, he delivered eggs, and I used to deliver eggs with him, and we used to go to various households, and he'd say to me, um, we always charged a couple of cents over what the uh, yes. A&P charged or something locally, and he'd say to me, uh, Joe, uh, those people are having a little trouble right now, uh, he's out of work, we got four or mm -hmm. five kids, uh, charge them 10 cents less a dozen than, than, than right. to, you know. and I'd say, Dad, you know, I, you know Listen to me. Yes. We're going to do it. No. Yes. Or he'd go in and he'd say to these same people, uh, I've got these eggs. I can't sell them. I'm not allowed to. Oh, They're cracked. Wonderful. But um, I, I'm sure maybe he oh. can use one or two, you know? And so I, there I used it to is. say this. Yes. But of course, my father grew up in a, he was poor. And although his father made a lot of money, it never got to the household much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And therefore, he was the head of the household from the time he was about 12 years old. And he was keenly aware of how difficult it was for people who were living on the edge wow. to, um, and my mother lived in entirely different circumstances. She uh -huh. grew up in a rather wealthy family and had, you know, the, the summer, uh, the summer, uh, house or cottage or club that yes. they oh, belonged to, club, yacht club and things like this. They would Very go out nice. swimming and things like yes. this. This is down in Brooklyn, Sheepshead Bay, yes. when it was yes. all just wide open land, sure. you know. Uh, Almost suburbs, probably. but somehow or other, yes. these two people got together, yeah. and it was it was an interesting contrast because I grew up aware of these two different worlds, yes, and got advice from my father when I used to venture into rather difficult neighborhoods to play baseball, you know, how to conduct myself, how to behave myself, and things like this. And even to this day, I notice that that. that there are certain lapses in my mother's ability to see things from the, from the perspective of a very poor person, whereas my father brought that with him. Right. So it was an interesting balance. Good balance. Yeah. To, why did you decide to retire in '92, John? Uh, oh, that's that's a that's an even wilder story. Uh, I was 44 years old, and I was bringing my mother-in-law up to have. Uh, uh, she had some heart problems. Wait a minute. Correction. Yeah. I want to correct something I said. So, you weren't 44 in 19. Uh, in in ninety two, no, retired. no, no, no. I was fifty five. Okay, eleven years before that. Okay, when you were forty four. When I was okay. forty four, I uh, I was bringing my mother in law up just just to get an ordinary checkup. She was having some heart problems, and I went to the cardiologist. And I'm sitting in his waiting room, and he walked out to me, and he he had a an idle worker in the back who was, <laughs> and he wanted an employer. And he said to me, you know, you have you ever had an EKG? You know. And I said, no. And he said, how do you feel? You know, I said, fine. And he said, you know, you really should have a baseline EKG. Think about it, he said. Just just think about it. And in, yeah. so uh, I said, all right, I'll, I'll get one. Why not? So I went inside and I lay down. And a woman comes in. And those days, they used to slop you all yes. up with all kinds yes. of jellies and whatnot. Yes. And I, what am I in for here? Yes. And, she said, and she's still talking to me. She turns the machine on. And all of a sudden, I see her face go white. And she grabs the piece of paper and races out of the room. Oh, for goodness sake. Well, I was so stunned. I couldn't believe it. With that, he comes in. Now, he was a very proper and erect kind of a person. Yes. Very tight, you might say. And he comes in and he has this rictus on his face in the shape of a smile. And he's going, do you have any pain? How are you feeling? And I said, I feel fine. Am I supposed to have pain? Yes. And uh, he said, well, well, well uh, uh, you know, do you have any pain coming in? How about going up the stairs at home? Do you have any pain? I said, no. no. And he finally said, well, very gently sit up here. You know, and he was treating me with kid gloves. He said, you know, I really think we ought to go to the hospital. And he's looking at the thing. Meanwhile, he keeps looking at it. And he keeps shaking his head. And uh, I said, am I, am I, what's, and he said, well, I, we've got an unusual EKG here. And when it was all over. And this is at age 44. At age 44. Very yes. strange EKG. Yes. Uh, so he eventually relented about that because they said, hey, look, I feel fine. I don't have any pain. I don't have anything. I feel great. You know, I exercise all the time, everything else. So he finally relented. But he gave me a little quick test on a, on a uh, steps that he had there. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, but I want I, you have to go for an echocardiogram. In those days, I had to go to Long Island Jewish, go in there. woman doesn't want me to look as I'm yes. doing it. And all of a sudden, she says to me, oh, you can see this. And I turned around, and I look up, and I was looking at it anyway. Um, and I could see that the valve was functioning properly and everything else. 
Well, the interesting thing was is that it developed that I had this kind of like very slight growth on, on a left ventricle, and I had this aberrant uh, electro, uh, electrical signal running across my heart. Well, I also had some high blood pressure. Uh, not serious, but elevated. Yeah. So they decided they had to get that under control, and I don't know why not. So, so they did. Uh, no big deal. Uh, except that every time I went in for this thing, the second time I went in, I had a regular checkup about six months later, and I didn't tell the woman. It was a new woman. He was a difficult man to work with, that doctor, oh although a good doctor. And she starts doing it again, and the same thing occurs. She yes. just grabs Runs it out. and races it. So from yeah. then on in, every time I have yes. one, I warn you give them a warning the, the technician that, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be a problem here. Just, just relax. And, and it's been gone much, much better. But because of that, yes, I felt as if, uh, I come from a long line of early dyers, say, uh -huh. among the males. And I said to myself, you know, I better get myself in shape. So I, I kind of changed directions. I had kids going through college. I was very concerned about them. I had mothers that were still yes. alive. And I felt that I really had to gear up. And if I wanted to enjoy myself at all, it'd probably be somewhere between 55 and 60. I better get the job done. And I did. That's why I, that's why I retired at 55. Yes. And in addition to that, the interesting thing is 10 years after that, I finally was sent to a specialist who, who was really studying this thing. And I walked in, and of course, everybody in the office, I'm walking, I have tennis shorts on and a yes. shirt and whatnot, and I just finished by, and I, I said to myself, everybody in the office is being propped up or, or sat up in the chair. Yes. Yes. And he walks in, he looks at me, he says, are you personnel? And I said, yes. yes. Hmm. <laughs> he shakes his head. And I went to see him later, and he gave me an exam and all of this, and uh, sat me down, and he says, now I'm going to tell you something. He said, um, you, were, you, 97% of all the people that have this are dead within a couple of years. My goodness. He said, you belong to the 3% that aren't going to be dead within a couple of years. He said, of that 3%, you belong to another small group of about 3 to 5% tops. He said, where this does not affect the valve at all, you've probably had it since youth. He explained exactly what happened. Uh, yes, it really was. I felt very lucky. He said, now, you could walk out and die of a heart attack, but he said, it wouldn't be because of this. <laughs> it was, a, you know, yeah. And, and so I walked out of there and I said to myself, well, I guess I'm in decent shape. And I want and to smell some right. flowers. Yes, yes, yes so absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And at the time that you retired, you were a librarian here in, in the Sondling. In the Sondling well, yeah, it was a central library okay, by then. Central, you know, okay, central. Yes, for both Sondling and Ross that's were right, joined too. together. Yeah. How many years were, were you an educator, Joe? Uh, altogether, 34. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. I started when I was 21 and I got out when I was okay. just 55. Now, uh, since retirement, yeah. what have you been doing? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I've always... Um, I've always had such varied interests. Um, I've always wanted to write to a certain extent, mm -hmm. and and I don't write well uh, to a particular subject, but I, I I kind of entertain myself, if you yeah, like. Yeah, but I'm don't say that because I've seen what you write. In, and yes, and yeah. you do. You're, you uh, write well. I've seen what. But you at any rate, I, I also have always enjoyed uh, managing money. Mm -hmm. All right, and I manage my own funds, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do that actively. And that absorbs uh, a certain amount of my time. Which, and there's uh, the old actuarial bent. Yes, to a certain comes. extent. There's no question about it. I, I like uh, uh -huh. tracking yes. trends and things of that nature. Yes. All right. And of course, the new computers allow me to do Wonderful. this. And I, I, I must admit, I've, I've tied onto that group. Um, also, I, I, I have now have two grandchildren. Uh -huh. And for the last two years, uh, the oldest guy is two years old, and the youngest one is, is just a little over one. And they're uh, uh, Brian and Noreen, and uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Noreen is extremely verbal. She's only one year old, but she she talks about everything under the sun. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, and and Brian too is extremely verbal, and and he's uh, now with the computers and with the interest of his mother and whatnot and his father, uh, they learn everything so quickly. Yeah. For instance, when he was. Uh, uh, just, just about 18 months old, he already knew all the alphabet. He could identify any letter, any time. And I remember my youngest daughter, Christine, was walking Jeez. across a parking lot toward a supermarket <clears throat> with him one day. And he's 18 months old and toddling along with her. And all of a sudden, he stops and he goes, ah, 
<laughs> yells out and he goes, N O P A R K N G. No problem. Yeah, because he doesn't read it. He just yes. says a letter. Oh, oh, and my daughter Christine was stunned. The people with packages and everything else turned around. And went. But, but they're both like that. Yes. The kids are, 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 are um, very quick. To, to learn these things today, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I think my kids also have a, a healthy respect for education and the need yeah. to learn things and teach their children early, and that gives me pleasure because yep, yep. I see that my children and, and all of the in-laws are the same way. Wonderful. I'm very fortunate in the sense that three of my kids are married, and although all of the families are very different, they are super families, uh, mm. they're, they're, and they're a pleasure to deal with. Each time I visit these other ah, families, uh, I have a good experience, and it's, and you're, it's beautiful. You're clearly having a lot of fun since you've retired, too. Oh, yes. yes. I mean, oh, good. yes. We, we've, good. we've traveled. Uh -huh. uh, Elaine and I have been to, uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, rent a home from a, a friend of ours uh, in Cheltenham, England, so we stayed there for a month, and then we followed that with two weeks over in Ireland and uh, bounced around there. My daughter had made friends with a young lady over there, and we got to see her family. And as the Irish always are, they're extremely uh, friendly, and yes. they invited us to their house. And they were uh, they were astounded that we had misunderstood, you know. But when they invited us to the house, they fully expected us to stay there. Uh -huh. And he was a well-educated fellow who was is part of the agricultural uh, department over there. And and when we said, "Well, we have this," you know, we're already staying in a in a B and B, uh, and Oh, he was almost like devastated. We uh, fully expected you to yes. be here all night. But uh, they're delightful people, so we, we've done were, that. Too. Were you married at the time that you came to Brentwood? Were no. Okay. Uh, the first year, I, I got married at the end of the first year. And that's an interesting story mm -hmm. in itself because uh, you have to remember things were very, very straight-laced. The administration had... Uh, uh, what year did you come to Brentwood, John? 1958 okay. in the fall. Okay. Yeah. And I had just turned 21. In fact, the <laughs> day I signed my contract was my, was my 21st mm. birthday. And um, I had come to Brentwood on a rebound. Uh, I had been sitting in a graduate class, which is another whole story. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't supposed to be in a graduate class because I hadn't graduated yet. But I, I talked my way into that one. And I'm sitting in this class, and a fellow by the name of Tully, the father of the fellow Tully who uh, has uh, had, was in the papers in Malvern, and was also that young man, <laughs> young man my age. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, he and I were both frat brothers at the time. But anyway, this fellow Tully came in, and he was saying that they were recruiting people for North Babylon, and they were interested in a, in a language teacher. And I was sitting in this graduate course in the Generation of 98 Spanish Lit. And when he saw me, he kind of recognized me, and he said, why don't you come out and apply? So I did, and I met this Mr. Peterson and, and the principal of the school there. And I... I um, had an interview with them, and they seemed to like it, and they said, well, what we really want is a department head. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was 20 years old. I hadn't yet hit Yes. Me. So I could be a department head. You know, I had 20 years of age. Jeez. You could be a rocket scientist. You know, you, yes. you don't really have any perspective on okay. things at all. And they said, well, yeah, maybe so. You know, so they went on a little bit longer, and they said, well, you have to know French, too. Do you know any French? And I didn't. Yes. I, only, I knew Spanish. And so they oh, hem and horn. Finally, they decided no. But they said, you know, Brentwood needs a language teacher too. Why don't you go out there and talk to them? So I got in my car. I zipped out here. Mm -hmm. I walk in the building, and there are people dressed you can't believe. They now the there. building means the Ross. Building? I, Ross building. Ross yes, building. the family okay. wasn't here yet. Right. Uh, I walked into the Ross building, which was only a year or so old mm -hmm. to begin with, and. Uh, kids looked the most bedraggled group of kids I've ever seen in my life. And I walked into the main office and I, I said, I don't know whether anybody's interested, but I, I've come this far. I said, I, I might be interested in the job, uh, but maybe not. I, I don't know. You know. I was thinking of talking to the principal or something about it. And Marion Young met me, a delightful okay. yes. uh, woman, and she said, wait right there. <laughs> and she raced into Fred Weaver's office. And Fred came out. First time I met him, he came out and he said, you're interested in a job? I said, well, yes. <laughs> in those days, they needed teachers. Yes, there was did. no, they used to run up around New England recruiting people. But at any rate, I said, well, yeah, I, I thought about it. I'm not so sure. I kept looking at these kids. And, uh, 
Fred said, here, and he hands me his whole set of keys, and he says, look around the building, go anywhere you want to. Oh, I, I'll be busy God. for another half hour, but please come back <laughs> in a half hour. So I walk outside, and I'm going into closets, and I'm oh, going into all sorts sake. of things. And I said, oh, no, I, I wasted a half hour. I wandered into the teacher's uh, lounge and whatnot. Yes. People said hello to me, you know. Yes. I walked out, went back, and uh, we stopped the interview, and I said, I really think I'm wasting my time. I said, these kids are are." are I said, I went to Chaminade, which was kind of strict, and okay. we always wear tie and jacket and everything. Now, the I interview said, I don't know was with, I could handle the it. The interview was with Fred initial, Weaver right the there. The initial interview was with Took Fred Weaver right, right there. Right. Okay. Now, that wasn't the official interview, okay. right. right? But that was the first entry level, right. entry level kind of thing, right? <laughs> and he said to me, Oh, no, no, you don't understand. He said, You don't understand. This is, this is senior dress down day. Okay. Oh, I said. Oh, that uh, explains it. I said okay. because they look pretty yes. bedraggled. Yes. You know, I said that's that's uh, yeah, at okay. least compared to my experience yes. in my own high school. So I said, oh, okay, fine. So then we went on to uh, another interview, and in this interview, you had Dr. Sheely, Dr. Sachs, and uh, Bernie Steber, and Fred Weaver. These were the four guys, Ooh. and they're sitting there, and oh, I'm boy. answering their questions. This oh, is boy. you know, on and on and on. That's right. So. Um, Sheely says to me, and, uh, and uh, what degree did you graduate with? So I said, I have a, a, a BA in, in uh, Latin American Area Studies in Spanish. I have a dual major. Oh, well, he said, you don't have any education credits. <laughs> My response was, I don't think they're very important. I said, I'll be glad to go back and pick up the necessary ed credits, you know, in some specialized <laughs> yes. program. And I don't think they're very important. With that, Sheely turns around, looks directly at Sachs who had his doctorate in education yes. and starts to go, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> so blazes at him. And I said, uh-oh, you know, this, this, is kind of, this is going kind of strangely. Oh, With that, Bernie Steeper says to me, could you teach a course right now? <laughs> Again, 20 years old, certainly. I could walk on water. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Certainly I could teach a course. So the four, the five of us get up, and we march down the hallway, and we walk into this guy's classroom. There's a teacher in there. Steeper in his usually imperious way just yes. says, sit down. So the yes. teacher sits down. I don't even know who the teacher was. They were yes. gone by the next year. Yes. But at any rate, I walked in. People didn't last long in those not, days. Not, no, 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 no. For one reason or another. But at any rate, uh, I, they give me the book. And they said, okay, carry on from here. And I look around and I realize it's a subjunctive mood. And it's the past subjunctive, which has two different forms and which is esoteric to say the least, oh, all right? Goodness. I haven't got the foggiest note. In spite of all my training in Spanish and whatnot, I said to myself, my Lord, I have no idea what this is. So I turned around as blithely as I could, and I said, who can, who can start to explain these forms? So this young girl in the front row goes, and I said, there's is the one I want. Yes. I said, well... Stand up here, and we'll go over it, go over part of it. And I said, if there are any questions, we'll. She got up there. She did a beautiful job of teaching. It was magnificent. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and they were so impressed because I used that's the right. students to yes. actually do it. Yes. And that's how I got the job. I was wonderful. invited to sign, sign up, and I said to myself, ignorance pays. And that's where it started. I was and, of course, I also taught two English classes that first year. Uh, I was going to ask you. As a dual I was going to ask you yeah. about memories from the early years, but I remember Joe. You <clears> told <throat> us one time, a group of us, your experience. I think it was the first day in the classroom. <laughs> tell it. Tell yes. me that story. Well, again. well, I. Um, it, it was kind of an interesting uh, first day. <laughs> I came in, and the first thing I, I felt I needed were some textbooks, and I walked in. There was Vira Rebo. Elvira Rebo was our department head. And she had replaced the Mrs. Cairns, who was mm -hmm. promoted up to uh, to uh, dean of women, but who still taught two classes. So I walk into the to this book storeroom, and Elvira Rebo, the English, uh, says, "There's no more text. I'm sorry." I said, "You mean I'm going to teach this course without even a textbook?" Yes. And she said, "Yeah, you'll just have to wing it." Yes. <laughs> I'm a first year teacher. I've got the foggiest notion. And, uh, whoa, whoa, this is terrific. She says, well, maybe Mrs. Cairns has some. She took a lot of books yesterday. So I go over to Mrs. Cairns' room, and she has got closets full of textbooks. Yes. She's teaching two classes. Yes. I said, do you mind if I have some? Absolutely. 
you should have been here last week when all the intelligent teachers were here in HR. I wasn't even <laughs> signed the week before. You know. And with that, I was escorted out of the room. Go, on your own. So I wandered down the hallway, and I, I still didn't know what I was going to do. I wandered back into the and, and Do I understand I, you didn't get any textbooks? No textbooks. No textbooks. None. Okay. No textbooks. None. No, okay. none whatever. So I start to walk down the aisle toward the classroom, and I, I figured, oh, well, what have I got to lose? I had yes. this big smile on my face, and yes. a big fellow by the name of Bill Mayo was walking next to me. He was a young man, had a family, which tragically died in a fire later that same yes. year. And he turned around, and he said to me, wipe that smile off your face. And I look at him, he's a big guy. I was, you know, and he said, look, kid, he said, you walk in, he said, Keep a keep a, a strict demeanor. He said you can always let up. He said you can't clamp back down. He I said remember you can that always advice. let up. Yes. I said okay, yeah. okay. So I'm a little bit more serious, and I walked into the classroom, and I didn't realize it, but most of the class were from 600 schools in New York City. Oh, uh, this particular class. Now, now a 600 was a class school of was a, 40. A 600 school was a school for people well, who were emotionally disturbed, and yes. incorrigible, all yes. sorts of things. You know, yes. uh, we didn't really have. Well, he had some special classes, but they weren't yes. for emotionally disturbed right. or truancy. And we, I sat down. Uh, I asked everybody, okay, now you can all sit down, just wherever you want to, just take a seat. And one kid doesn't. So I, I just kind of ignored him. I said, just, just sit anywhere. With that, he walks up, and he comes closer and closer. I'm sitting with him, what's going on here? He walks right up to me and bumps me with his chest. He's a pretty yes. big kid. Bumps me with his chest, and he says, make me. Oh, Lord, I said to myself, oh, first moment I'm in the classroom, <laughs> make me. I can't believe this. So I said to myself, oh, well, 21 years old. I guess teaching, I'm not cut out for it. But this kid has to learn that he just can't challenge people like this. So I took a half a step back as if I was giving. And then I just jammed him and pushed him and kind of wrapped him one. And he sailed across the room. He hit the back of the wall and sat down on his rump. And I said to myself, well, I guess I'm fired now. He'll get yes. out and complain, and I'll be the end yes. of that. You know? yes. And he said, hey, you're okay. Oh, and he stands up, and he sits down. I said to myself, boy, that, that's incredible. And we went on, and we got along. Yes. And and uh, one of the, uh, I think it was Jack Finan said to me, you know, you're going to have to do something. Uh, why don't you just read them? Uh, 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 Huck Finn. Okay. So I got Huck Finn. At. That was, yes. uh, by the way, that was approved of by my department head at the time. Mm -hmm. She only lasted one year. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. <laughs> that was approved of. Because that, I, that later on worked its way up to a banned book list, didn't it? Well, yes, point? among other things. Among oh, yeah, sure, there are all sorts sure. of ramifications yes. Yes. that I'll get into here. Yes. But, but <laughs> there it goes. And I start reading this book, and we're discussing this book. And I'm saying to myself, this is crazy. Every day coming here. My, 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 uh, my notes were saying this, too. Read chapter one, read chapter yes. two. It's yes. just absurd, the whole thing. So at any rate, uh, we go on like this for about three weeks, and we did other things too because I supplemented that with all kinds of stuff I was bringing in from home, and sure. notes that I had from sure. my own experience and things. Because you know, just read a book of is course. absurd. But at any rate, I, I was developing something on the on the winging uh, it in a sense on right. on a. But these kids didn't want to learn anyway. Basically, most of them were sleeping in class, or they they had home lives that were terrible. Yes. The two girls were pregnant by the end of the year, and and they both went. Uh, uh, tough kids that were constantly at war with one another and Brentwood you had to in those, separate in, them and sit them down. In, in the late 50s, early 60s, Brentwood was just about ready to experience the explosion of the suburbs that came uh, Yes, it was just, just starting. Yes, And yes. you had a mix of blue-collar families, working-class families, and also some professional families from the hospital that yes. lived in Brentwood and yes, children of that family. So you had a very interesting mix mm -hmm. of... Uh, I mean, the demographics was 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 incredible. Was incredible. Yes, that's right. In point. fact, uh, just to go on a little bit further, uh, about three weeks later, in the same classroom as we're going yes. on, uh, the door opens again. Boom! And a guy walks in, and he's got the motorcycle jacket on and the new dungarees, student. big, yes. big, yeah. And he waves right. his sheet of paper. He's a new student. He goes, "Yeah, I'm new." Right. I said, "Oh, okay, fine. Just put the paper here, and you can just take that seat over there." Kid stands there, you know. I said, that seat right over there is fine. He says to me, make me. Oh, oh I said, there we go oh, again. Lord, we're going around again. This is absurd. <laughs> and with that, the first kid, yes, uh, <laughs> whose name was Jerry, stands up and he says, hey, you, me and him's got an agreement. Sit down. And the kid says, 
the new kid says, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. And he sits down as polite as, as nice. anything. Right? Yeah, nice. In those days, they were also observed all the time. Uh, yes. Administrators came in, would interrupt your classroom. Right. There was no, pro no there protocol were, whatsoever. None whatever. Just, they would no. interrupt with the squawk box ten yes. times a period. It was it was unbelievable the kinds of interruptions you had on a constant basis. This is before the union. This was before. Oh yes, before any before kind of rights at all. It was yes. just incredible. True. And 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 they didn't seem to care or mind. Yeah. Their 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 job was the paramount job. Yes. Ours was kind of secondary. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> he came running in and, uh, well, we'll put it this way. We were visited so often, all of a sudden, one of the kids comes in to me. He says, hey, Mr. Purcell. He said, uh, you're getting visited this period. I didn't know it, of course. Yes. I said, well, I, you know, I said, no, you know, oh, boy, this is quite a group to visit. <laughs> and I, Whoa. And he says, hey, we got a deal worked out with all kids. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to raise our hands. If we know the answer, we got the right hand up. If yes. we don't know the answer, yes. it's the left hand. Yes. Oh, I said, that's nice, I guess, you know. So we start the classroom. He walks in, the principal, Fred, with me, sits down. And his kid's hands going up all, the time, all over the place, you know. Like, ah, <laughs> where wonderful. is Madagascar? And oh, you got geez. kids, you know. Oh, but geez. some of the kids forgot their left and their right hands and oh, they couldn't get it straight. You know, I mean, that yes. was, so right. you'd ask a kid, he didn't know the answer at all, you know. Yes. Ooh, and he kind of oh, oh, forgot the wrong oh, hand, geez. you know, this sort of thing. Yes, but we sad. had enthusiasm, see. Yeah. Well, when it was all over, Fred loved class participation. Yeah. So I got a beautiful, <laughs> a beautiful <laughs> review. You know? So to myself, this is never enough. Land. What is, is some? Really a, you taught English. You taught a language. I taught English and I taught Spanish. And okay. and Bernie Stieber observed me for about twenty straight days in every class that I was in. For the first, I, it was just. And oh. he he also wanted the lesson plans on a minute by minute basis. Oh my gosh! Yes. So every minute I had to write down what I was going to do yeah. that minute, and then the next minute, and the next minute, and he wanted to be able to follow that all the way down most rigid kind of teaching I have ever oh, boy. experienced in my life. Right. I don't know how I lasted, except that... Uh, well, I dare say that in those days, teachers did not last. The turnover in Brentwood was phenomenal. Huge. Yeah, and huge. the biggest problem they had was keeping people on staff. That yep. they could, yeah. People would cut their teeth here, they'd get some experience, and then they'd go elsewhere. Yeah. Well, but, even later, when <laughs> years later, when 20 years went by, and we went to a special... Uh, uh, gathering of teachers learning how to uh, uh, to cope in a group situation, mm -hmm. and the, the fellow from Adelphi that was directing this this uh, uh, ten day program said, "I have never met a group of teachers that are more independent minded right, than you the people." Yes. And the reason why we were is because anybody who wasn't was immediately weeded yeah, out. I think the, there is a culture in Brentwood, a, a culture among the teachers. And part of that culture was created from these early experiences. It just, it groomed a certain mindset. Oh, yes. Oh, that, yeah. You, you, that's whose you purpose either, was survival. That's right. You either drew from within yourself or you, you were yes. nowhere. And it, you didn't get help from anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you went to ask for help, it turned into a, a, a betrayal. Yes. I can remember I was so upset with my department head, uh, Bernie Stieber, at one time. That I went in and I happened to mention it to another department head who's still in Brentwood, um, but not active yes. anymore. And I said to him, wow, I'm having such a problem. Maybe you can give me some advice. And I started asking him. <laughs> the only result of that was is that I was, he immediately ran to the principal and to Bernie and said that this, this teacher is uh, you know, causing problems. He's spreading word. I was called down and what are you doing? You know, that sort of thing. <sighs> and I also, of course, you know, attended my, my, uh, the, the teachers' association meetings in those okay. days. But in those days, the teachers' association was dominated by the administrators. Yes. And I remember one assistant superintendent used to sit in the back of the room and take names down. Yes. And what we said it didn't bother me because I was too young to really <laughs> be annoyed by it. But I remember one time a suggestion was made, and I said to myself, this is terrible. I, I don't remember what it was anymore. I just was appalled. And I could see my fellow teachers all going, <laughs> Yes, but crazy. nobody's saying anything. Nobody's saying anything, right. So I, I raised my hand uh, and I opposed it. All right. I just called down the superintendent's office the uh, next day uh -huh. and was put right on the line. If you continue to do this sort of thing, uh, yes. you know, uh, you, you won't remain here and we'll, we'll bring charges up and all. 
And yeah. I thought, wow, this is an interesting situation. And, the, and as I recall, meetings were a regular occurrence at any time, and they would go on interminably, too. Yes, we, we met at least three times a week. And, yeah. and Fred would talk from about 2 o'clock until about 6. Good God, uh, yes. Just virtually yes, nonstop. Yeah. And most of it was just a repeat of messages that he had put in your box. That's right. So it got to the point where people would simply come in, see the messages, and throw them right in the garbage. Yes. Because they knew that they would have a meeting that afternoon in which he would repeat everything that was in the messages. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no point in wasting your time and, twice. And people wonder <clears> what uh, what associate, the Teachers Association has accomplished. <laughs> what they came. Why, yeah, right. right and right, why right. they grew and why the union came out of yeah. it and so on. Let me ask you, Joe, because yeah. I want to move to a lot of other other areas yeah, with you stuff, before yeah. we have run out of our time together. You were assigned to primarily, you spent most of your time right here at the high school, I take it. Yes, I was in the Ross okay. building most of my years until the library was consolidated. Okay, yeah. and you decided at some point to move into library science and to leave. I was here place. five years, and at the end of the fifth year, there were three things that came along simultaneously. Uh, one was to leave teaching entirely. Mm -hmm. And Ray Fournier and Presno were two fellows that yes. had moved out of the teaching ranks and are now administrators. And, and Ray in particular asked me if I would be willing to join him for a year in developing something. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I felt that that was a very short term kind of a thing. And I, I really didn't see any future in it for myself. So I said no. By that time, Bernie Steva had left the district and come back again. Hmm. I had been teaching full-time language, and then Bernie came back, he walked in, and <laughs> as is his wont, uh, he took all of the very best students from every language class, Jesus. put them into his class, yes. and uh, <laughs> every language teacher said he took <sighs> all of the very best kids. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the year, of course, what Bernie would do is he'd compare your record with his record in the regions, okay. see? And he'd berate you because you and didn't do as well as he did. He would pluck. Having, having stacked the deck right, to begin with. He would pluck right, very bad. Right. But at the same time, uh, they decided that they'd cut down the number of, of Spanish classes that I had to three. And in the middle of the year, uh, actually about three months into the school year, they, you know, consult Bernie took two, switched kids all around. I was left with three. And, and they decided to create two new English classes, and I would get them. And they went to the English teachers, and they said to the English teachers, pick three kids from your class and give them to Joe. Well, you can imagine the class oh, that I ended geez, up with. You, oh, it, you, I looked and I oh, said, every one of these kids is, is a, a class A. A. I mean, this kid yes. is, is, has had all kinds of problems. Oh, so yes. I ended There's up with history, two... Right? Two incredibly difficult classes, yes. which, um, which, actually, because of my youth and enthusiasm and whatnot, I, I what did they used to, to say, with. Joe? They'd say, you know? "Let it be a challenge to you." Yes, right? let it be a challenge, and, and it really yes. was. <laughs> in your twenties, everything was a challenge yes. that you could overcome. You could overcome the world, you know that sort of thing. And we got through with it, but. By the end of the year, Bernie had offered me a job, full-time job, teaching Spanish in one of the junior highs. And Bill Graney, I had brought my English classes, these English classes mm -hmm. that were so off the wall. I brought them down into the library because I found out that these kids had no familiarity at all mm -hmm. with culture or how to mm -hmm. look things up or anything mm -hmm. else. So we did an exercise in using uh, reference materials. And I was always interested in the library, always. I can remember back in elementary school yes. that myself and two buddies used to sneak out the front door of the school because the principal used to watch the back door, but never watch the front door. So we marched down these beautiful marble steps yes. for about, you know, and out the front door and ran to the local library and would sit there all day long. Sanctuary. going through. That's yes. right. You know, yes. really, yes. when I think back yes. on it, yeah. we'd also sometimes go up and play baseball. But this is... this is. You yeah, know what I particularly very, remember about, about my early days and association with libraries? There is an aroma in a library <laughs> that is such a wonderful fragrance, the, uh, whether it's the old books or whether it's just the combination of paint or carpets or whatever. But I'll walk into a library today and it brings back such <laughs> wonderful warm memories of my first association with libraries. I don't know whether uh, whether anything like that well, existed for you. Well, I don't know. It's a possibility. But <laughs> but I have always, I, I felt too that this was the, the key to education. Yeah. I, I finally had yes. decided definitively that the teacher in a box with 30 students yes. is simply not education. It's a training program. It's a program to 
to make it easy for administrators to say to parents, yes, I know exactly where your yeah. children are. Here they yes. are right here. Yes. And this is what they are learning, yeah. see, and, and we have it all boxed up for you so yes. that nobody can complain. But real education doesn't take place there, and every no. teacher knows it. Real education. In fact, if you have your brightest students, the brightest students learn in spite of us. You bet. And, and uh, I can remember I had two extremely bright students in a Spanish class that I had maybe the first or second year. Uh, he later went on to be a tremendous uh, power in the computer mm -hmm. uh, uh, business. But this young man, a lady named Raskin, his name was, uh, the older brother, um, used to come in and say, you know, Mr. Purcell, he said, I really know the Spanish. And he did. He, he kind of <laughs> learned it all on his own. He said, I, I really don't want to participate mm -hmm. this way. He said, I have important things to do. Like, So he used to sit there and read the times or do some rather esoteric mathematical uh, exercises and whatnot. And I felt this was fine. I mean, this kid, sure. this kid was just, he wanted to know everything. And yes. he did. He just yes. simply, and he would partake. He would always have an ear open because it? bright yeah. kids always do. They That's always true. know what's going on around Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And, and he would participate and, and intervene anytime he felt that he step, could contribute right. mm -hmm. or, or everything else. Well, of course, an administrator passed and looked in the window and said, no, yeah, no, this can't be this. Uh, somebody. So what if, in fact, that's exactly the words that we use. What if some visitor comes walking through here, yes. say from the State Department, oh, yes. and looks in and sees this kid reading right. the newspaper? Yes, yes. I said, what's the difference? Yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. tell, tell a fellow this is the way it is. See? And... Um, Later on, I got a, uh, it was kind of interesting because I got a commendation from the State Department as a librarian. Because evidently, uh, when the State Department guy came down, they showed him a Sondling library first. Bill didn't happen to be there that day. They showed him a Sondling library that day. And I guess a number of administrators were kind of blowing smoke all over the place about what a marvelous collection we have and whatnot, you know? So they came over to my place and the administrators started doing the same thing. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, the most important books we have here are not these great classics. Yes. Yes. I said, it's this collection that we're <laughs> developing because mm -hmm. these are the this is the level at which the kids, the majority of kids can read here. And it, well, we had administrated, oh, that's not, you know, but, but we, we, we adhere to the list that's put out by the State, State Department right. and whatnot, you know. And I said, well, we have them. I said, but this is what's important, and this is what we're developing. Well, I got called down the office later, and I was told, you know, you really weren't playing ball yes. with the rest of the people. And whatnot. So I That's went back. The public relations piece. But then the district got a commendatory letter, commendatory See, letter from yes. the State Department, yes. and this guy sent me a personal letter Isn't that great? saying thank you very much, okay. but this was the best yeah. library I had visited oh. in quite a long while, you know. And then they brought me up, and I said, "Well, uh, I guess you know, we'll we'll take that other thing out of out of your record." In those days, you weren't even allowed to see your permanent record. But they had evidently put a letter in saying That's that right, I had not been cooperative. So, uh -huh. so they pulled the letter, uh -huh. supposedly. This is before the Freedom of Information. Before, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Incidentally, yeah. Frank Conti was uh, was a, wasn't he a librarian at one? Uh, that was an interesting thing too, because if you remember, I remember any time a new technology comes in, yes. the first thing that's important about the new technology is the hardware. Yes. And people have to understand the hardware, they have to be able to use it, and of course they develop things that are specifically used with the hardware. Once the hardware has reached a maturity, uh, and anybody can use it, then the most important thing becomes the software that you can use with it. For instance, the film strips and the films and all of these things. Right. And classifying them and being able to reach them and get to them becomes the most important thing. Yes. So when AV materials first became important in schools, film strips, film slides, strips, and all, and the all fellas that. that could create the film strips, the fellas that could that could make the tapes, the fellas that could do these things, the techies, in other words, yes. uh, they became very important in school mm -hmm. districts, and they obtained, and particularly in our school district, this was the guy that became in charge of all the mm -hmm. libraries. But he had, he did not have a clue as to how information is organized okay. or how it can be accessed. Okay. In fact, in his particular office, where all of the AV materials were stored, they had no list of the AV materials. You would simply go in and ask Mrs. Besser, who was the head of that little office yes. uh, under this, this other individual, mm -hmm. and she would say, 
a, a, kind of a mystical kind of thing. She would put her hand to her head and go, <laughs> I think I know where that is. And yes, she would get so, up and kind of like okay. drift over to the yes. particular area, pull it out and hand it to you. Yes. She was quite good. Yes. But after a while... Yeah. Uh, no science attached to it. Nothing attached no. to it. Not yeah. only that, but it becomes obvious that when the professionals start to come in and McGraw-Hill starts to produce good film strips, that yes. the guys who were producing local film strips those local film strips became obsolete and of no use in the classroom because kids looked at them and laughed. Yes. You have to have a certain yes. level of sophistication or the kid is not going to pay any attention. Interesting, you, you, you mentioned McGraw-Hill. We also had a superintendent who later on who became <laughs> uh, yes. CEO of uh, McGraw-Hill, yes, Joe did. Dion. Yeah. Who, who Joe Dion. For a while. Yeah. And Joe Dion is the fellow who put the techie fella in charge I see. of all the libraries. You were certified as an English teacher. You were certified as... I was as certified as an English teacher and, and as a Spanish teacher. And, right. and then you got certification. You in applied, library science. In library science. Right. And right. you saw quite a few changes take place in that field. In the, in oh, the enormous. Years enormous. So. Um, the first guy that I met who was interested in computerizing it was a fellow by the name of Vertanix, who was here a librarian. Uh, it was of Armenian descent, had written an Armenian English dictionary, mm -hmm. and he was in the junior high. He probably was not in the right spot for mm -hmm. his particular talents. He, he didn't particularly seem to uh, cotton to junior high students, and probably because he was in his late 50s when he first took this, this position here. But he was very interested in automating the libraries and computerizing them. And immediately I recognized that this was the way to go. Now, in those days, they had punched cards and tapes and things yes, like this. Yes. It, it really wasn't optimal. But you could see that down the road, this was the way it was going to develop. So he got into this. And, and he uh, kind of um, um, wet my appetite mm -hmm. for this particular type of thing. Now, yeah. when I applied for my sabbatical, I had already done quite a bit of study. What year was that, Joe? Uh, that was 20 years ago now. Okay. Yeah. 76 uh, around? 76, somewhere yeah. in that okay. general area, mm -hmm. yeah. And I had been teaching in the district for 19 years mm -hmm. when I applied. And the whole thrust of it was... was that was that why was, we still had sabbaticals. Yes, we did. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And I must admit that I was, I was getting pretty weary by that time. It was, it was a constant fight just to keep the mm -hmm. library in operation, uh, being starved for funds yes. and kind of indifference mm -hmm. and things like that. But at any rate, I, I applied for this. And uh, the whole thrust was that I was going into college and whatnot, uh, back to college, in order to get formal studies in how to apply uh, computers uh, to the library science. And I must say that I learned a great deal and had also made arrangements for uh, a couple of companies um, uh, to bring computers in and the original services, uh, 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 search services, mm -hmm. all right, databases. Mm -hmm. They were willing to bring them into the school as a demonstration project. So when I came back, if you remember, you had, to, you had to give them a big report as to what you were going to do. And then when you came back, you had to justify your existence yes. and what you did by another big report. Yes. So when I finished my sabbatical, I wrote up my report. And in it, I included the fact that we had all of this opportunity and that we should act on it right away because the companies were more than willing to do it for free. Mm -hmm. right? And I waited. And a month went by, and no one contacted me. So I called up Jack Finan, who was the head of the program at that time, and I said, Jack, what is it? He said, we've submitted it. They don't want to talk to you. I said, what do you mean they don't want to talk? The board doesn't want to talk to me or the, the committee doesn't want to? Ah, they said, um, they're not going to implement it. They don't believe, they think it's a fad. They don't want to get into any of this business with computers and whatnot. And they just simply feel as if this is, this is yeah. nonsense. Yeah. And I said to myself, well, that's typical of the district because in 1960, Oh, I'd say it was about 1967 or 8, all right? There were still no television sets in any of the classrooms in Brentwood. Yes. And Frank Conti and I, you mentioned mm -hmm. Frank before, well, by that time we had gotten together mm -hmm. in the library, Frank realized that he didn't have any, any yes. skills in the library. Mm -hmm. And he came in one time, he says, you've got to organize. Would you help me? Yes. And I said, certainly, Frank, I will, but only under condition, you know, yes. that you don't smoke that terrible cigar in my office. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only condition I put on. But anyway, he, he, 
And we decided to order a television set. Well, it was bounced right back. You don't need television. Yes. 1968. I said to myself, this 69. is 20 years after I yes. saw my first TV program, yes. like in wow. 1947. Yes. And I said, every other school district in the island yes. has it. Yes. So we were rejected. So we figured that they just made a mistake, that they hmm. just didn't understand. So we wrote it up a little bit more thoroughly and sent it back again. We wanted to spend our own budget money on this, yes. all right? AV money. Came back, no TV. No, rejected. They mm -hmm. won't buy it. Mm -hmm. So Frank, we're getting, I mean, teachers are desperate. They're saying, yes. you know, you know, they had tapes by this time. They had their old VHS oh, uh, yes. three-quarter mm -hmm. inch things. Mm -hmm. And teachers were asking us, you know, I'd like to get some yes. of this stuff. There's great stuff on, mm -hmm. on TV. I said, okay, fine. So Frank and I wrote up this proposal for a CRT receipt. <laughs> <laughs> cathode ray tube and whatnot, you know. Absolutely the most abstruse language you could possibly use. Sales right no through. one could yeah. ever interpret what the <laughs> hell we wanted at all, all right? Okay. Filled with X number of transistors oh, and whatnot. And yes, it sailed through. Of course it sailed sure. through. So we got the TV. And then they found out it was a TV. Yes. And they were embarrassed. Oh, dear. And they came in and were going to fire both of us. Oh, dear. But notice they, it still wasn't at the time when teachers were, were plentiful, so they didn't fire either of us, but they... You know, big, strong reprimands. What do you miss most about oh, the all kids. those years, the kids? Yeah. The kids, you know, it's funny. You have this, <laughs> this, this peculiar relationship to kids. But I enjoy kids. Uh, I have five of my own. Yes. And it was just, they force you to rethink everything all the time. Very they do true. not allow you to get in a rut with your thinking. And all of us come from certain influences, uh, whether they be ethnic or, or generational or whatever you want to talk about, you come with certain set ideas. And then you spread these ideas out. And the kid immediately stands up and says, no, that's false, or I don't believe that. Yes. And it forces you to ask the kid, well, where are you coming from? Yes. And then you find out the kid is coming from an area that, in many cases, you know, I, I like to think of myself as being a person who tries to to uh, encompass most of every every kind of thought and think about it, wanna, but kids always come up with new things, new ideas, new challenges, and answering those and trying to reconfigure your whole thinking. Now, the kids aren't always right, of course not, but that's not the point. The yeah. point is is that they have a different perspective. They're coming from a different place, and you should be aware of it. Where I see the greatest contrast is in when my uh, fellow generation, the kids that I, the guys that I grew up with in my old neighborhood, all became fairly successful. Uh, and they, of course, had their own teenagers. But in talking to them when we got together, it was like, I don't understand this kid. They were all screaming and yelling, like, I don't know where the kid is coming from. Of course not, because during the day, these guys only talked to other men who essentially yes. shared their point of view. Yes. And here in education, we don't have that handicap. No. We don't. And therefore, you, you constantly are revising it. And it was easier to deal with my own kids. Until, of course, the last one, who was kind of a curveball. <laughs> you, know, you get a little arrogant. Right? The first four, I really felt I knew how parenting uh, yes. went. You know, had it down. Yes. Now, they all caused yes. a little bit of a problem, but I thought I really yeah. had it down. Yes. And then the last guy uh, forces you to go back and rethink. He a lot threw a curveball. Yes. He was an honest student at one point. Great. He decided two years he was going to quit school. Uh -huh. And I, of course, I went bananas. Uh, you know, yes. This is nonsensical. And, and, uh, I went in and I talked to an educator. I went in and talked to a guidance counselor that was dealing with him. And he said, you know, he said, you're too close to it. Yeah. He said, I came from a family of achievers and, and I'm the youngest one. And he said, my parents fought me. I didn't go back to school until I was 26 years old. He said, I'm going to tell you to do something very, very hard. He said, you're going to ignore this kid. You're going to let him say and do anything he wants. He's a good kid. He's not going to go off the wall and do anything really strange. He's a bright kid, so he's, you know. But my kid, my son, really felt as if he was going to be vice president or something within six months, you know, yes. that sort of thing. Yeah. And and he had some bad experiences with employers and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, jipping him out of money. And, mm -hmm. and he realized that the world out there is not a, a great place. And I kept my mouth shut. I really did. Mm -hmm. I'd say hello to him and whatnot. And then <laughs> I remember it was May. He had been out of school about five months. And he walked in and we were sitting reading the paper. And we had a cordial relationship by this time, but I didn't spend a lot of time talking to him. And he came in and looked me right in the eye and he said, pretty stupid, huh? And I said, oh, Lord, you know, yeah. keep me okay. quiet. Keep okay. me quiet. Yes. Now I'm stupid, you know. And he looked at me and go, oh, no, no, Dad, not you, me. He says, me. He says, I'm going to go back to school. Ah, and I didn't say a word. Yes. And I said, if that's what you want. 
that's what you'll do. And of course, he did go back to yes. school. He went on to college. He did Once. well, and he, yeah. you know, now he's doing fine. It's but not, this is the not, kind of it's thing. It's not that, your timetable, Joe. Exactly. That's, right. that's, that's exactly right. right. Each each person has their what, own. What don't you miss? And perhaps this is very obvious, but I want to hear the way you put it into your words. What don't you miss? I don't miss you? the daily stress that a okay. teacher has put on. Okay. okay. Um, and that stress is extremely high. You never know where it's going to come from. Um, you, you begin to be very wary of parents. Mm -hmm. uh, kids accuse you of things that aren't, aren't possible. Okay. I can remember in one year, a student came in and he got into trouble in a library and he was behaving very poorly. He went out and the first thing he said was to the administrator, he said, uh, this guy called me a bad name. Uh, he referred to my uh, ethnicity and he said that, you know, and he cursed at me and he did this, that, and the other thing. And uh, that's why I got angry with him. So I said, well, and immediately the administrator called up and said, you know, you're going to have to come down here and defend yourself. Defend myself. Mm -hmm. This is an accusation that's completely untrue. Yes. Well, we're bringing the parents in and you're going to have to defend yourself. Oh, I said to myself, this is great. You know, here I got a couple of years to go and I got into this. This could be yeah. ridiculous, you know. So I walked in to the so-called meeting, and as I walk in, I see a, a woman there who is now about 40 years old, and uh, I had had her as a, as a student back in, in, in a Spanish class. I said, ah, old guy. I said, how are you? Great to see you. <laughs> and she said, oh, we're waiting here for a teacher to come down. I said, that's me. She said, you? She said, not only were you a great teacher and I enjoyed you very much, but you got me a job after this. Do you remember that? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, kind of vaguely. Did it work out? She said, it certainly did. She said, I'm the aunt of this boy over here. Yes. He is accusing you of doing this. <laughs> and the kid goes, <laughs> yeah, he's really shaken now. Yes. You know, well, uh, I, he may not have said all of those things, you know. He didn't say any of them, oh. Olga says, don't oh. you think? And all of a sudden now the administrator says, well, you see, see that, that's, that's fine. Okay. But until then, you got the distinct feeling the administrator was not in my corner. Yeah. And this yeah. is constantly the yes. situation. It is yeah. rare to, to go into a meeting like that and feel that the administrator yeah. is going to support yeah. you. The administrator, and of course, administrators have their own problems. They're caught in a squeeze, too. They, yeah. uh, they are the least protected people, at least the building administrators, are probably anybody in the district. Sure. Yeah. They're, uh, they're point men who are uh, disposable. No, yeah, you bet. There's a, there's a lot of pressure there. And uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a, it appears to be almost a different reality. The teachers uh, in the classroom have a one reality. Yeah. Administrative point of view uh, doesn't allow for some of that. They have their own, they have their own reality. It's interesting. The, the brothers at Chaminade, uh, the Marianist brothers, I don't know whether they still do it, but they used to have a very interesting process. Uh, you could only spend about seven years outside of a classroom. Mm -hmm. And then, no matter what you were, you had to to recycle back into a classroom. Mm -hmm. So one guy went from being the head of the physics department at the University of Dayton to teaching my physics class at Chaminade the next year. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't just because he's a religious doesn't make him a happy man. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. And as yeah. he walked into the classroom, he took a look at the text that we had, and he looked up. He says, "Everybody have the text." Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Now, he says, I want you to go to pages 3 to 12. Uh, 3 to 12. Okay. He says, now, tear them out. Oh, jeez. <laughs> tear them out. <laughs> tear them out. So we tore them out. All right. He says, all right. Pass that basket around. Throw them in the basket. Oh. Good. <laughs> now, he said, this is what I'm going to do with the textbook. And he took the textbook and he hurled it on the back wall. And he says, take these home and never look at it again. Okay. <laughs> he said, because the first 10 pages are dead wrong and the rest of it is trash. Oh, my goodness. And you're going to learn physics. And he oh taught us goodness. mechanics, basically, the first goodness. college, yes. first level of uh, mechanics in college. I, I got to tell you that this time has gone so fast. I know that I'm Certainly running down has, on yes. the time that we have. So I want to make sure to ask you a couple of questions before Certainly. we have to be... Uh, before we have to draw this uh, a ring around it. <laughs> of all the things that you have uh, professionally accomplished, Joe, in your life, yeah. what have you been most proud of? I suppose the ability to automate the library finally mm -hmm. and to make it a really useful uh, and accessible 
uh, thing. Unfortunately, I've been given to understand that it's already completely wiped out. So, well, so it, you know, it's it's something that I, I felt I, I did and I accomplished, perhaps, and I was perhaps. proud of doing it. But then I realized yeah. within, I started asking people to come in and learn how to mm -hmm. operate the system mm -hmm. about two years before I left. Nobody seemed terribly interested. Okay. And I realized then it was a dead issue. Well, then perhaps that leads to the other question, which I right. want to ask you. Tell me what, if anything, you would like to have been able to accomplish during, you know, during the years. Uh, well, I would have, I would have liked to be able to integrate the, the, the local library into a wider okay. area. Uh -huh. um, and it certainly was a, it was capable of doing it, you know, right. but it just didn't happen. Uh, I hope, though, that at least we set the groundwork so that it would make it easier for the next. Oh, I think that's exactly right, and I think that I every say. every teacher that comes along yeah. is standing on the shoulders of people yeah. who have come before. I think the the nicest thing that happens, though, is every once in a while I'll be walking in a mall or somewhere else, and some some grown person now will take me aside and say, "Hey, remember me? I was yeah. so and so. You did this or that or the other thing." And thank you. Yes. And it doesn't happen very often. It might happen once every six months or so. But he's like, uh, in the library, you met a great many kids. Yes. You didn't necessarily have as close a relationship as you would in a classroom. But frequently, it was at a crisis in their lives. They had yes. to get a report in or yes. they had to get yes. certain kinds yes. of information. And therefore, they will remember you because you, you satisfied a crisis need. And frequently, exactly. you wouldn't see the kid again. But he'd remember you. And it was difficult sometimes when I'd meet these people. Uh, sometimes they had children with them, and they'd say, this is you know, a library, and, you know, and I, I couldn't remember the p people's names. And that's, uh, that's a little is, embarrassing. You know. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to make sure we, we, we do mention before we, uh, before we finish here? Is there any subject or any incident or any, any <laughs> moment that you can think of? that you There are so like, many things that I happen know, in, the, yeah. in the years, John, yes. that it's difficult it's to, to, uh, let me ask to you, isolate. Let me then turn it this way. And I enjoy the, the interaction with the faculty members. I think that was great. Okay. Uh, you had people from all, you know, the, the outside world sometimes thinks of teachers as being kind of monolithic. They all mm. think the same way. That certainly wasn't my experience here. Yes, they had yes. people who thought in every conceivable direction. And that was very stimulating to me, and I enjoyed that very much. Yeah. Is there anything that might that we might offer to teachers who are just beginning their, their tenure, so to speak, even though tenure is up for grabs now in some districts? But you yeah. know what I mean. Their professional experience in the classroom or in the... In the administration, they're just beginning now. What what might we offer them as uh, as, as a little Well, I, I think there are two things, if you wish. One, it's good to get rid of your idealism as quickly as possible and get to be, uh, take a real honest you, and good Are you really look. saying that? Get rid of your idealism? Yes, get rid of your possible. idealism as quickly as possible and get real. Uh -huh. And that means that you have to be willing to to do the things that are necessary so that the students benefit by your presence. That doesn't mean you're not idealistic. Yes. It's just you don't react to things in an idealistic way. You react to them in a realistic way because you must always take into account the pressures that are on all of these other people that you're reacting with and therefore deal with the real world. I think too frequently very young teachers uh, deal with the world in such an idealistic way that they don't come up with real solutions to real problems. Perhaps young uh, teachers expect too much when they first come in, though. Uh, that might be. I think that's a, that's part of it. There's no question about. It. They really think they're going to change the world, okay. and they're not going to change the world. But on the other hand, when the dissolution sets in, that's not correct either. You actually are influencing a yes. great many more kids yes. in a very positive way, and in ways that you can't necessarily quantify. Um, and you, you are don't changing. even realize you're doing it until much later when, when the people are old enough to come back. Yes. It's like when I, I used to say to my own children when they were in their early teens, and they used to say, to me, I want to do this, or I hate yes. you. Yes. And I'd say to them, I really don't care if you hate me now. I am extremely concerned if at 35 years of age you say you hate me. Yes, yes. And that's the only, that's when you're and finally an adult and you still hate me, then I've done a bad job. And the paradox but. is that in the process, you are changing yourself oh, and yes. you are changing the world. Yes, I mean, that's exactly. A, yeah. exactly. It's a process, yeah. too. And you have to recognize it as a process. Joe, I've enjoyed An this so much. Process. I can't thank you enough for being with us. It's my pleasure, John. Know, it really is. I know everybody else yeah. can enjoy this, too. So, thank you. As you know.
thank you for allowing us into your home and to do the, the follow-up or second part of this conversation that we started some weeks ago. Uh, I remember we, we had not touched at all upon some of the more personal issues uh, involving family. Uh, but I want to ask you uh, so about something that you and I have in common. You're a Roosevelt baby, aren't you? Uh, yes, of course. 1937, I was born. Yeah, yeah. And we have that in common, too. Yeah, yeah. And we've uh, just recently come through another national election here that will take us into the next century. Right. As a right. matter of fact, uh, I hear tell that it was the lowest turnout in 70 years for any Yeah, since 1924, they said, yes, yes. I don't know what happened in 1924 to make it such a low turnout, but <laughs> it's, it's obvious that there's yeah. been a... What do you, why do you suppose, uh, why do you suppose at this point uh, yeah. the turnout was as low as it was? What's your take on it? Well, my feeling is, is that their, that our forefathers made, made an error in addition to allowing slavery. Their second error was something that, that was inherent in their own beliefs. And that is, although they didn't believe in nobility, they certainly had enormous prejudices against the average citizen. They believed in elitist kind of a society in which those that were most fit to rule should rule. And that, of course, meant that you had to own property or be rich in another way. And, and their entire, our entire system, the Republican-based government, is based upon that premise that, that we have a representative government and these very bright people will get elected by other bright people. Um, <clears throat> and it essentially excluded most voters. From, from the polls. Slowly, we enfranchised a lot of people, but we still made it very difficult for them to vote, <laughs> you see, for poll taxes and all sorts of things. But what has finally occurred to these people that had been disenfranchised all of these years, they are still disenfranchised. And it doesn't make any difference whether they vote or not. The people who are in power represent a rich and elitist kind of people uh, if nothing else, educated, and therefore um, the rest of the population really has no say. And although they get a little trickle down occasionally, the real money, the real uh, uh, initiatives go to benefit the rich. And in fact, it was kind of interesting to see in this last uh, election, there was some mentions being made to the fact that, yes, they're most willing to, to uh, cut the so-called welfare benefits of the poor and of the needy, but the, uh, the welfare benefits, which amount to four times that amount, to big business and to, to uh, tax write-offs for the rich, they weren't mentioned. In other words, you're not going to take, it's bad enough that we get, and to a certain extent I can understand why it's necessary, to be allowed to write off at least some of the interest on your mortgage and things like this, but we now have that for two homes when half of our population doesn't even own a home. And we've made it, particularly since the Reagan administration, almost impossible for these people to purchase a home because we're back to what occurred before World War II. And that was that the home uh, is basically available only to those people, uh, home ownership, only to those people who already have a lot of money. What you say is very true. It occurs to me that uh, education <clears throat> was... Uh touted as being a, a, a major issue in this recent presidential election, uh, with both sides focusing to some degree on teachers and unions and, and the needs of education. And I've often wondered, do we need to see the country change before our educational system becomes what we, we as educators know it can be? Or will the educational system be the reason for the change of system and perspective of the country. Uh, which comes first here? Well, our educational system is skewed, as you well know. For many, many years, I can remember, uh, you probably recognize it more than I did uh, as, a, as a social studies teacher, but it was always amusing to me to find that legislators, uh, legislatures like the New York State Legislature passed laws concerning the teaching of economic systems. And in New York State, Every time you mentioned an alternative economic system to capitalism, you were supposed to, by law, point up that the capitalist system was better and why it was better. 
in spite of the fact that it isn't necessarily better in all in all circumstances, particularly laissez-faire capitalism, which is just as, as detrimental to the average guy as, as, as any other type of, of arbitrary system. And therefore, uh, yes, there has to be certain fundamental ways that we change our approach to society before education will change. Because educational uh, response is very conservative. Uh, but it ref it's a reflection on <clears throat> Rest of the society to some degree too. Yes, education, can, we can't do much in education until society itself wants some sort of change. Uh, unfortunately, many of the people that are, that are impacted the most are also the people that don't want change because it's That's human right. nature not to want change, any kind of change. And in fact, even the poor are against change because they're hanging on by the fingernails and any change could mean that they could lose their grip. So therefore, they support the status quo in spite of the fact that change, for the most part, would, would benefit them more than anybody else. So. Listen, as a, as a Roosevelt baby, uh, yeah. we lived through or were born in the, the, the height of the deaths of, actually, 37 was coming out of already the worst part of the Depression. Yes, it was, to a I'm certain sure extent. I'm sure you have uh, some poignant memories from, of growing up. In well, I don't. Okay. And the reason for that is, although my parents was, were strictly middle class and perhaps even upper lower class on my father's side, um, his father, who made a lot of money all through his life and shared almost none of it with his family, <laughs> um, gave him some very interesting advice uh, in early 1929. He said to my father, I think that it's time that you got out of the rug business and the gold assay business. He had two businesses going as a young man. And my father was still in his teens at this time, late teens. And he said, I suggest very strongly you, you jettison those jobs and I will get you a job with the assay office now before the crash comes because it's going to come. And he said, and my father often stated, it's the only good advice he ever got from his father. But he did act on it. Interestingly, he did act on it. And he, he, he obtained a position with the assay office. And of course, when the crash came, my father had a secure job. Now, that secure job lasted through the early 30s. And my father, who was not a Roosevelt supporter, <laughs> mainly because in the early 30s in the assay office, uh, suddenly, Roosevelt appointees began to flood the ranks of all of these public offices. And he said, we had guys there who absolutely did no work at all and still collected their money. And he said, this soured me on this kind of, of make-work situation. So my father was never a, a Roosevelt Democrat in that sense. But he always had a keen sense of the poor needing a leg up, but he didn't feel that, that was the way to do it. Okay. He had ambivalent feelings in that sense. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, uh, her father was an electrical engineer who worked for what was then the, the uh, British Manhattan Transit, or the BMT. It became a division later uh, as they amalgamated. I think they actually amalgamated in the 20s, but he was still more active in the BMT than anywhere Is that else. what BMT originally stood for? Brooklyn Manhattan, Tra Manhattan Brooklyn Transit. Man yeah, Brooklyn BM, Manhattan that's right, okay. yeah. And then you had the independent IND and then the IRT, which was the uh, interborough rail transit or something like that. But at any rate, <clears throat> he worked with BMT. And he had a job all through the Depression, too. Uh, so my father, when he finally decided to make his move, I had, um, I guess I was in the offing, <laughs> as it were. My father decided that he would try to get a higher paying job and one that uh, he felt he liked. And he took the test for the fire department. And in the group of people that were admitted in his class, his year, there were only three people out of about 150 or 200 appointees somewhere in that area. I think it was 150, that's what he used to say, who were not college graduates. Everybody who took the test in those days what were college was, graduates. Was, this was 1936 and 1937. 37, I believe, is when he was appointed, okay. just before I was born. And um, we'll have to compare. Do you yeah. have a photo? Do you have a photograph of that class? Or do you have a photograph of your father with other people in the? 
with other firemen. Uh, my mother probably has them. She has. She's still alive and going well. So she has. You know, about the same time, it would be ironic if they were in the same. Isn't that interesting? I didn't realize your father was even a fireman, John. I don't know why. It just uh, escaped there's, there's me. There's you know? another parallel. Absolutely, yes, yes. And during that era, in the 40s, uh, early in the 40s, they began drafting firemen out of the fire department, naturally young men. And then they realized uh, that, wow, if, if you know we get bombed and, and you know people had a a strange view of, of the capabilities of, of the enemy, <laughs> uh, thinking they could you know, fly across the Atlantic and bomb New York and we'd need all these firemen. And my father's attitude was, yes, Joe, I'm working two shifts all the time as a fireman, but it's a lot better than the alternative. Get, you know, and a lot, of his, uh, a lot of guys that he knew and had come in with, they had been drafted and they were in infantry units and, and all sorts of things. My and, father uh, you know, mentioned several times that at mm. the end of the war, there was not one single member of the London Fire Department left living. Oh, really? Every wow. Every single member of the, of, the, uh, of the Fire Department there was killed in line of duty during the... the Your war. father was in the London Fire Department? No, no, no. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, oh, I see, I see. Me many times yes, about, yes. That's the alternative yeah. to if, when the war comes here. Oh, if the war comes here, yes. That's yeah. uh, that's yeah, an enormous problem. Considered yeah. a vital occupation. Yeah. And my father used to say how they used to suppress the news, how there were riots in various poorer areas of New York City and never hit the newspapers. There was a conspiracy not to publish any of that sort of thing. He said, we'd go up there and fight a fire, for instance, maybe in Harlem or, or, uh, or uh, downtown uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn uh, Brownsville and whatnot in Brooklyn. And uh, he said... Uh, uh, people would often set the fire in order to create the circumstances so that they could end up getting the things that, that they didn't have. And he said, we'd be shot at. He said, there'd be bottles thrown at us. And he said, the police would be there in great numbers, horseback police. And why not? He said, the next day it wouldn't even be mentioned. And he said, we'd, we'd have people injured in these kind of things. Interesting, the things you know? today that make headline news is are not new in the world. Uh, everything that is, it says in Ecclesiastes, has been before. It has been. And it's, and it's true. History repeats itself it's all the time. We, you know. didn't, we didn't have access to the news. No. And to some degree, even today, I think we don't have access yeah. to all the news. But but at any rate, to come back to, to you, Joe, where, where was this all taking place now? Where did you live in those years? Where, well, uh, where were you born my in? first, I was, <laughs> I was born in Astoria. Uh, that was where my folks lived, but they didn't live there very long, and they almost immediately moved uh, somewhere else in Richmond Hill or something. And then, and then uh, we we bought a house out in out in Williston Park, which was pretty far out for that day and age. But that was when my father worked in the assay office. But when he obtained the position in the fire department, he had to move back into New York City because everyone in those days was required to live in the city. So the first real memories that I have were living in a rented home in Woodhaven before my folks purchased a home out before the war started in 1941 out in Queens Village. And uh, that first home back in, in off Woodhaven Boulevard, I can remember, I guess I was an aggressive little rascal because uh, the people downstairs also had a child and evidently we didn't get along. And so my father built this fence across the backyard. I can remember him building it, and I kept getting in his way and things like that. It's kind of odd that I remember this sort of thing. There was a, uh, a family, G.M. Balvo, Dr. G.M. Balvo, who lived next door. And I can remember his son dressed up one time in a, in a it was Halloween, and it scared the pajamas out of me. He came in the backyard. I was about two and a half or three years old. I couldn't have been, well, maybe three and a half. And I saw this guy come in, boo, yelling at, you know, this monster. And I screamed bloody murder. And I remember the kid took his mask. Now, the child himself couldn't have been more than seven or eight, you know. Yeah. He took all that. It's me. I'm next door, you know. I wasn't buying any of it until my mother showed up, you know, sort of thing. But uh, these are the oddball little things. Now, the weird thing is it's such a small world because this fence was, was you know, my half of the yard I could play in his half of the yard, the other little boy could play in. And here we are, neighbors. Now, 10 years later, 
I didn't realize we moved out to Queens Village within a, a year or so there. But, well, Joe, but even yeah, even in sure. those days, Woodhaven was suburbia. Oh yes, it was very much so. Yes, and yeah. my mother's mother only lived a couple of blocks away, and so therefore we used to go over there quite frequently. Later, when we moved to Queens Village, I can remember taking the, the bus and going down to Jamaica. And in those days, there was still a trolley running in Jamaica. And we would sometimes get on the trolley. There were, there were different ways you could get down to, uh, to uh, Woodhaven. And we'd take a trolley down somehow. And then it was a long walk. But my mother didn't mind it if it was a nice day. And I used to love to ride on the trolleys. Then the trolleys disappeared, of course, because the, the city government was bribed enormously in order to get rid of the trolleys by General Motors. And, of course, they introduced the buses. That's another whole historical little artifact you come, come to later on. But Queens Village was a great place for kids to, to grow up in at the time. It's amazing now. I still see many of the, the fellows that I grew up with. Really? Oh, yes, very much so. We, we see each other maybe twice a year, three times a year. We still go to each other's daughters, sons, weddings, and things of that nature. See, And uh, we stay in contact. It was a very upwardly mobile middle-class neighborhood, mostly of cops, firemen, uh, people, civil servants, if you like, uh, uh, but uh, very concerned with getting along with life and doing the job properly. PS 135 is the school I went to. And uh, was the first school you that was the first school I attended, right, which was only two blocks from my house. And um, it had a wonderful principal by the name of Mrs. Halleck, and I had one, a succession of magnificent teachers. Teachers all over New York City wanted to come to 135 to teach because it had a tremendous reputation for kids being relatively bright and cooperative and whatnot. Uh, two years before me, my brother-in-law's class went through there, and he was with the worst class that probably ever went through 135. They were, they were all such, such characters, really. you know. But my class, on the other hand, two years later... Uh, I think we had about 26 boys in the class. Of the two, there were two eighth grade sections, and there were 26 boys between the two sections. And uh, 15 of us got into Brooklyn Tech. So we had a tremendous thing. Three of us got into Regis, you know. We, so we had a, a really good record of, of, it was a good academic group of kids, and they went on to a lot of success later on. Um, and we had a 17-year reunion. Don't ask me why we picked out the 17th year. But in 1967, we all got together again at a, at a reunion. And uh, it was great seeing everybody and uh, somebody was reminiscing. That. That's right. That's right. Somebody wanted to work on it. Uh, a girl by the name of Carol Tresh, who later became a Carol Stevens, did most of the work, I guess. But, um, but it was, it was very nice. This was from... This was from my grammar school. That's right, grammar school. I graduated from the grammar school in 1950, all right? I was 13, or just 13. And, uh, and, uh, that's through eighth grade. Now. That's through eighth grade, yes. In those days, you have to remember, the schools were kind of crowded, and one of the ways that they relieved crowding was to uh, promote people quickly. So I, I skipped two classes by myself, and then another whole half a year was made up by the whole class. They skipped the whole class a half a year just to make room in the school. See? Uh, yeah, so we, we, we bounced right along in that. And you talk about the war making an impact. The very f I didn't go to kindergarten. My folks felt that I would learn more at home than going to kindergarten, and they probably were right. I, I knew how to read long before I went to school. I, I remember every free moment my father had, we went somewhere. We, we visited every museum in the city, my sister and I, and, and we went all over. Uh, uh, we went swimming every chance we got, things like this. My father was very concerned about this because he did not have it as a child. So he insisted that, and he was a bright guy. He, uh, his sister went to CCNY and helped put her sister through CCNY. Uh, he didn't go to college, which was kind of a sore point with my mother. She had wished that he had gone and, and spent the time going to college, too. But he, he just didn't, all right? Well, where was your father born? I didn't ask you. Was my father was born right in New York City. New York, right? Yes. His mother had been born in Oslo, Norway, which was known as Christiana in those years. And um, there's a kind of a conflicting thing here. But her father, when he emigrated to the United States with her as a very young girl, uh, he became a handsome cab driver in New York City, and that's what he did up right through the, the teens in, in New York City. He, he drove people around uh, Central Park, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, there was some controversy there 
Um, she was Catholic, and from what I gather, the reason why they left Oslo, Norway, was because uh, right after the Norwegians finally fought their way into freedom from the Swedes, and by the way, she was very, very uh, keen on that. I once made the mistake not knowing as a child, introducing, oh, this is my Swedish grandmother, and she nearly, t one of the few times she nearly tore my head off. Uh, I am not Swedish, I am Norwegian. And, uh, oh, sorry, you know, I didn't realize there was this animosity. And uh, for the Danes as well. For the, that could be, could very well be, but I, she only expressed it for the Swedes because Norway had broken away from the Swedes only, you know I mean? only quite late. Yeah. What I mean is the Danes also had the same uh, antipathy toward the Swedes. Swedes. Oh, I see. Yes. Well, Sweden at one time kind of controlled that whole area. That's right. Yeah. But, um, but at any rate. Uh, so that, that's your father's lineage then is, is of, of mixed heritage. Mixed heritage, half Irish and half Swedish. And when uh, she came over here, the reason why they came over, at least in part, was because they were among the very few Catholics who were in Christiana and they were persecuted very greatly. So they left uh, Norway. And she did not have a very good life over here. Her father was poor, and, and, and they didn't do terribly well. But she did marry this <laughs> rather aggressive Irishman, whom my aunt and my, my father's sister always, uh, we didn't stay in very close contact, but I can remember when my father died in 1968, he, his sister came for the funeral from Ohio, where she lived, and she walked in and she said, oh my God, it's Nick all over. Now, she called her own father Nick, his name was William, but everybody in the neighborhood referred to him as Old Nick because he was the devil incarnate, <laughs> all right? So <laughs> she referred, that's right, so she referred to me uh, as I, she said, my Lord, it's Nick incarnate, meaning her, her own father. Evidently, I, I don't look much like my father, but I evidently do look reasonably like uh, him. And also, my mother says that I look very much like her uh, father's father, a fellow by the name of Morgan, who came from uh, the Montreal Morgans and came down here and could speak French and English and eventually uh, married a woman who was an immigrant from Alsace and spoke French. If he hadn't spoke French, they probably wouldn't gotten together. Now, my mother had these two people, grandparents on her mother's side, uh, I'm sorry, on her father's side. Uh, the mother was rather austere. And the father was a rousing, <laughs> uh, hail fellow well met kind of, you know, jolly guy who uh, she remembers, with, my mother remembers with great fondness as her grandfather. So evidently, he later got a job, I know, through his son as an engineer, train engineer, not an electrical engineer. His son was the electrical engineer uh, at driving a train. But he had a kind of a... a um, a streak in him that wasn't governable too terribly well, <laughs> and he, he'd get angry once in a while at the at the um, at the bosses. And uh, there were one or two incidents in which he decided to take one of the trains for a little extra ride that he wasn't authorized to do. So, so his son was hard pressed to keep his father in line. Say, you have a, there's an interesting thread that runs through your family because. Yeah. Personal, as you explained the first time we sat down, right? He was originally uh, of French origin. That's right. Now you're yeah. talking about a French connection. Exactly. From the yes. Side of the family. Yes. Uh, yes. And, it's and although the name is Morgan, which is a Welsh name, so, oh, so you had a Welsh-French kind of connection up in Montreal. Yes. But yeah. the Catholics managed to find one another in this country. And kind of. Yes. Yes. There, there is some indication, though, that she really was not Catholic. My grandmother on my father's side, that she only pretended to be Catholic in order to marry the Irishman <laughs> who actually treated us quite badly throughout most of her life, but she had <laughs> three, two living children with him. She lost one. What about your siblings? Are there any I have one sister who is exactly 18 months younger than I am mm -hmm. to the day, and uh, uh, she went to St. John's along with me, was on the dean's list and all sorts of things, a very bright uh, woman. She, she married another... Uh, uh, a fellow from St. Francis who went to St. Francis College, and he became a fireman. He was a he was an accountant, 
And uh, he felt as if he really didn't like it. You know, it was one of those things. And my father said, well, you know, you're really going to have to get into something else. And he later became a fireman and he became a lieutenant. Uh, he passed, and later, after he retired from the fire department, uh, Bill Hillary, his name is, went on to become uh, a teacher at the fire academy. So he made a second career for himself as a teacher and he certified as a teacher. My sister became an insurance and was licensed and still is licensed to sell insurance. But she decided after hearing me, I guess, or, or at least uh, I think it's in the blood more than anything else. Uh, she is now teaching uh, kindergarten in a Catholic school in, in New Hyde Park. And she, she loves it. She which, just, which brings me yeah. to the next question, which is a Certainly. return to where we were about school. When you finished high school, yes, you decided to pursue higher education. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, uh, I had this, neither of my parents went to college. Um, and they wanted me to, of course, very badly. And I was fortunate enough to be reasonably bright. And we had a, um, I kept saying, gee, I'm going to have to go to college. I'm going to have to go to college. But here we are in May of the my senior year in high school, and I still haven't even applied for a college. I don't know how to go about doing it. And in those days, although Chaminade had a guidance counselor who was a nice guy, they didn't give you a lot of help in, in doing these things, all right? Um, they assumed that the parents of somebody else would get you in, see, that sort of thing. So we had a visit from Father Newman, who was the president of St. John's, to visit and talk to the seniors of our high school, Chaminade, and I'm sitting there and he's saying, if any of you gentlemen would be interested in going to school and whatnot, uh, we'll have applications and whatnot for you. And he talked about St. John's. And when I said, gee, a couple of guys in my old neighborhood went to St. John's, I, maybe that's what I ought to do, see? And with that, he, thank you very much. And he walks out with my principal and the assistant principal. Now, in Chaminade, you didn't do things precipitously normally, all right? It wasn't wise. You got yourself in a lot of trouble. So I just jumped up from my seat, and I can remember my teacher saying, where are you going? I said, I'll be right back. I have to go talk to somebody. I ran down the hallway, and I said, excuse me, Father, excuse me, Father. I said, uh, I I've got to talk to Father Newman. And with that, the principal was saying, oh, Mr. Purcell, because they knew everybody by name. I said, I'm sorry. I have to talk to him. I said, I'm very interested, but I don't know how to go about doing it. And it, to a certain extent, it embarrassed the, the principal of Chaminade a little bit because it was obvious that I wasn't getting the help to even apply to any school, see? So they backed right off. And I talked to Father Newman, and Newman thought this was pretty great. He really did. He was a very nice guy. And he said to me, I'll tell you what you do. He said, um, you come down. He said, we'll give you a, uh, he says, it's long past the admission. He said, but we'll give you an IQ test. And he said, we'll give you an admissions test. And he said, if you pass that test, here's my card, call up. And, and make the deal. So I, uh, I made it, went down there, took the test, and did well on a test. And so I was admitted to St. John's. And uh, my father was, oh, this is, this is great. I, you know, the rather unusual way I got in. But I was always a little this way. It's the strangest thing. I went down the day that I was supposed to register, my very first day in college, and I know nothing about college. All right? So I walk up. And I go to the registrar's uh, desk, and they have everybody's envelope. And they hand you this envelope. They've got all your classes down there, and this is what you have to do. So I walk outside, and I said, oh, my Lord, I have class at 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and like 3 o'clock in the afternoon every day. I said, I'd be in there all day long. And then meanwhile, I've got all of this time to diddle around in between classes. I don't have any time for this. This is absurd, see? So I still have my letter in one. I said, you know. A lot of guys here. I bet you he won't even remember me. So I stashed this, okay? I stashed the whole envelope, and I get online again. And I walk all the way up online, and I said, oh, here's my name, Joe Purcell. They don't have my envelope, naturally. So, you know, a big packet. So I said, gee, I have the letter, you know, that I've been accepted and everything else. It was kind of a special deal. Oh, yeah, he said, we probably just never got around to making you a packet. Come on in here, he said. These are the courses you have to take. This is the schedule. Make yourself up a schedule. Good man, Joe. <laughs> I sat there. I swear when I think back on it now, how I had the chutzpah to do this sort of thing is beyond belief, you know? <laughs> but I just sat there, made out my schedule. I had my classes at 10, 11, and 12 on three days a week. 
The other, the other two days, thir- Tuesday and Thursday, I decided to go in at, at 1 o'clock. I had a class at 1 and another one at 2. So I had two days I could sleep late besides everything else. Oh, it was just, yes, it was just perfect. And I just made these things. You always tell kids, take risks. Take, that's right. Take risks. Take a shot at it. You know, this sort of thing. But, you know, from what you've described, growing up in your family was was pretty nice. It was a pretty good experience. Yes, I had a great family life. I truly did. I had a marvelous childhood. I had a mother that was very bright and very active, and I had a father uh, who who was a tremendous athlete, very bright guy. Who uh, and my father and mother they taught me something very valuable, probably inadvertently. They would argue about everything. All right, but the argument was always civil never violent or anything like that, uh, with one or two exceptions. But in any way, very civil, and they're both very forceful, say, very forceful personalities. But then, after they got to realize that this is the end of it, then they'd say, one or the other would finally say, okay, this time we'll do it your way. We'll do it your way. That's fine. And they would. They would both pull together and do it that way. And I said to myself, now that's the way to resolve arguments. That works. You know, that sort of thing. I also was the only son, in a sense, on both sides of the family, and the oldest grandson on both sides of the family. So I was king. I really was. And this was, uh, there's no question about it. It gives you a certain leg up in life. I don't know if I've ever asked this question, but do you have a memory that for you is your earliest memory? Is there any one memory that you can think of that stands out? It's difficult to know whether it's an earliest memory or whether or not it's a reconstruction. But I do remember, in a sense, my first responsible thing, and I keenly remember playing in the water. So I may have reconstructed the rest of it, but that was important to me. I was about three or four, and my family was selling the house in Williston Park, And they had to sell that before they could buy the house in Queens Village. So it was early in 41, or perhaps even late in 40. And they went out there to to do some work in the house. And when they got there, they realized they had left the keys back in, in, in Woodhaven. So my father and mother had a little discussion about whether they thought I would be bright enough to go in through this cellar window, into the coal bin, slide down the coal bin, walk over to the stairs, go upstairs, come to the back door, pull a chair over, stand on the chair, and open the lock, see? Well, my father kept saying, yes, he can do it. I know he can do it. My father, my mother was a little reluctant. But nevertheless, in the window I went. And my father stuck his head in as far as he could to see whether or not I at least had gotten to the stairs. And I went up the stairs and I went over and they, they could see me now in the kitchen through the back door. And I said, very good, very good. Get the chair. And as I'm pulling the chair across the floor, I realized that the sink was there. And I love playing in water. So I pulled the chair over to the sink, turned on the water, and was splashing around in the water, see? Meanwhile, my parents are going slightly bananas out in the in the driveway, you know, trying to, no, 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 come over, bring it over here. Well, evidently, I, I finally complied with what they did, and I, I pushed the chair over the door, unlocked the door, and then they gently pushed me out of the way and came inside, turned off the water, which by now was spilling onto the floor. And, and yes, that's one of the early... I, I guess adventures that I had, but they gave me a great deal of praise. They didn't yell at me for playing in the water because essentially I had satisfied the conditions. I had I had accomplished what they wanted me to accomplish. Uh, now, what they, you know, there was another incident uh, that seems to be one of the my character. I suppose I was just barely old enough to to listen to people's conversations. And uh, I was in the kitchen, and evidently the talk got to be on some topic that they didn't want the children to hear, see. So I was told to go in the other room. So I went. And there I am, right in the doorway, see. And my folks said, and he was talking to some, some, uh, somebody there that was relatively important at the time. And uh, <laughs> my father said, Joseph, I told you, go in the other room. And I looked down, and I got my feet 
right behind the sill. And I said, I am in the other room. Well, whoever this guy was, I don't know who he was, started to laugh like crazy. And whatever the deal was that my father wanted to have happen, it went through because of this particular <laughs> little bit. So uh, <laughs> so it worked out. But they used to tell that story all the time, you know, about how um, little kids react to certain things. One so. of the things that I don't remember touching on with you, and we may have, so you can, you can correct me, uh, most teachers over the years have yeah. had to have second jobs, have had to do things to, uh, to, uh, to cover the basis, so to speak. Right, right. Did we talk at all about whatever second, second occupations or second jobs that you may have had, uh, assuming that you did? Well, um, there are always second jobs. They almost always were related to education. Okay. I do remember for a very short period of time, a, an old neighbor's son, who was actually very close to my age, uh, was selling Wellington Fund. And this is when I was back in my very early 20s. I had just started teaching. And he suggested that I sell this. And I went out and uh, I went to the meeting. And at that time, Wellington Fund was an independent fund. It didn't wasn't part of the Vanguard family. And I didn't realize I was really selling it through a group that was taking some sort of a break off. But I didn't know that at the time specifically. But at any rate, I, I started selling this fund and the first person I went to was a doctor out here on, in Huntington. And I walked into his office and I said, I'm, you know, I'm representative of the Wellington Fund. You've contacted someone. Oh, yes, he said. Oh, yes, he said. I really, he said, I've got to do more than just put the damn money in the bank. He said, you know, we do a lot of cash business here. And he said, over there, get that, get that uh, bag over there. It was a shopping bag. All right, so I walk over and I pick up this shopping bag and I realize it's filled with loose dollar bills, a huge shopping bag. So I walk back to the man. I said, this is all money. And he said, yes. He said, I, I, he says, I just throw it in there. He says, what am I going to do with it? He said, I'm busy being a doctor. I don't have time for this nonsense. He says, just take the money, count it, and, and put it in the Wellington Fund. And he said, tell me what it is later. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I said, well, how much is here? He said, how do I know? So out I go, and I sit down, and I count it up, and I find out it's about $4,000 altogether, all right? which, was, which was just about what I was making for my entire year in Brentwood. And uh, I said, this is crazy. So I immediately called him up and said, look, I've got it all here. This is what you've given me. He said, what are you calling me for? I told you what, you know, did you? I said, no, no, no. He said, just do it, just do it. I said, wow, this is incredible. Later on, I went to people. Who, who, and here I'm only in my early 20s. I meet this guy that's about 35 or 40 years old. He's got about five kids, has no savings, has no insurance, and he wants to buy Wellington Fund. You know, so I said to him, you know, you can't do this. You've, you've got to set up a kind of a, you know, program for yourself. And after you do these things, then I'm willing to talk to you. You know, that sort of thing. He said, you're not going to make any sales that way. This is the guy that I'm trying. I said, I know, but you've got a wife and kids. You've got to, you know. He said, if nothing else, get some insurance. Go down to the local savings bank. It's the cheapest way to do it, and you get some term insurance. Well, he took my advice, but I never sold him any Wellington because he never had any savings. He never had any extra money, you know. Uh, Is that what you did then? But, I, but for a short period of time, I did this. But I didn't like the emphasis on selling things to people who didn't need it. The attitude was, hey, look, if that guy wants to buy it, sell it to him, you know, that sort of thing. And I really didn't want to be part of that. I was too idealistic. And, of course, that was a great weakness, too, in all through my 20s, uh, being too idealistic in education, too. Yeah. Of course. But yeah. that's something we learned uh, by uh, getting hurt a few times. And yes, exactly. Right. So I left that. But then, of course, in education, I did some tutoring. I, I always worked night school. I always worked uh, night school. I worked almost every year until maybe I was about uh, 50 years old. Oh, I and uh, and uh, I also worked summer school. Oh, so. I see. Okay. And summer school was an interesting difference, too. And it, at first, in summer school, we had uh, three two-hour classes. And it was a long day, exhausting day. That was the first year I worked summer school. And in fact, I signed up with Jack. Jack Fine and had trouble finding people. So, uh, no, he was, it was Tom Buller was the first year, but the second year was Jack Finan. And it was in my second year that I signed up and Jack was having trouble getting people because it was still at six, six uh, 
uh, hour day. <clears throat> and uh, it was also eight weeks, so a long, long and period of time. Su- in other ways, how was the summer different from the, from the regular session? Because you worked... You well, worked- in the first place, you only got kids in the summer. They were failed, kids who failed. But for the most part, the real troublemakers weren't there. Uh, there were kids that were slow in one way or another, or just who didn't pay any attention, or didn't like the teacher that they had had the year before and things like that. I think the, the saddest thing were a couple of kids that I'd fail myself and end up being back in my class, and I'd have to sit them down and say, look, you know, let's, you know you've got to do certain things in order to pass and whatnot. But it, it worked out pretty well. But I can remember the first year that Jack was there, I got a phone call home here, and Elaine answered it, and she said, Joe, Mr. Finan's on the phone. I came running out. Hello, Jack. How you doing? What's up? He said, well, it'd be a lot better if you were here. He said, summer school started this morning at 8 <laughs> o'clock. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. It started before. Oh, wow. I thought it started tomorrow. No, no, he said. It's already on, Joe. We're covering your class. If you can get in here, it'd be greatly appreciated. And the other one, uh, the other memorable thing, I guess, in summer was the summer that I caught an enormous case of poison ivy. We had poison ivy all along the fence line in my backyard here. And I had told a neighbor of mine, I've got to get rid of it. He said, I just got rid of mine. Here, I'll loan you my gloves and everything else, my garden gloves. Unbeknownst to me, the garden gloves that he had used eventually was soaked through with the oils. And here I put these garden gloves on, and I think I'm doing the right thing. Instead, I'm, I'm, my whole body is permeated by the oils, and I broke out total bodies. Uh, uh, it was just awful. It was just, just awful. And I remember standing in my calamine lotion, you know, I, I looked like some sort of mummy out of one of the, you know, uh, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello movies, you know, Frankenstein, but the kids thought it was great. You know. The other thing that's kind of interesting about summer is the first time I ever taught uh, less than a ninth grade class. My first year I had one ninth grade English class, but I had never taught below that. And about my third year, fourth year teaching summer school, Jack gave me a seventh grade class, English class, to deal with. And I walked in, and of course I have a loud voice, and I, I guess I'm and I told these people to, you know, sit down and be quiet. And let's get on with it because I felt that I had to establish a little, you know. <clears throat> I didn't get anything out of these kids for like the first week. They were they sat in the chairs like they were paralyzed. And I'm trying to lighten it up and I'm trying to get them. And I'm, tr- I'm joking a little bit the way you do with kids to try to let them know. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I said to myself, what, you know, what am I doing wrong here? And then finally, one day, uh, maybe almost the second week had already gone, and I'm desperate. I, I just said, oh, yeah, and he just got, he got slammed in the face with a pie or something like that. It was about the level of the humor. And they all broke out laughing. Ah, I said, this is the level of their, their, their funny bone. So from then on in, we kind of worked out, and they realized that I wasn't an ogre. And you had to appeal to an entirely different level. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was some of the humor that they thought was funny, pretty scatological, you know. Uh, yes. You know, <laughs> at that level, you know, that body functions are are a big uh, a big issue. See, <laughs> oh, oh lord, so I, I never stooped that low, but you you know, the kids themselves began to uh, well, yeah, we cool that a bit. Do, that's right. right. That's exactly right. So, yes. Thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome, John. And uh, I think before. Uh, we get chased out of town here. We've been here so long. I'm going to I'm no problem. Uh, close this. You have other commitments. No problem. Thank no you problem. very, very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed it, John.